Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, a special extended interview with Robert Bo Jacobs of the Hiroshima Peace Foundation. He talks about his work on the Global Hibakusha Project, which tracks impact from exposure to nuclear weapons, explosions, and waste on communities through multiple generations. He's also just back from a tour of Scandinavian long-term nuclear waste repositories and offers some profound and poetic insights on the problem of that long-lived radioactive waste, which is going to be with us forever. Plus... Numbnuts of the week for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness. And though the news will be short this week to accommodate the interview, there will be enough honest nuclear information to keep the terrifying spirit of Dia de los Muertos alive 24-7-365. Boo! All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, November 1st, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from a different perspective. Time for only one news story this week, but it's a big one. The United Nations has adopted a landmark resolution to launch negotiations in 2017 on a treaty outlawing nuclear weapons. This historic decision heralds an end to two decades of paralysis in multilateral nuclear disarmament efforts. 123 nations voted in favor of the resolution, with 38 against and 16 abstaining. Eight nations with nuclear arms, the U.S., Russia, China, France, the U.K., India, Pakistan, and Israel, opposed or abstained from the resolution, while North Korea, which does have nuclear bombs, voted yes. Japan, the world's sole victim of atomic bombings during war, voted against the ban. The International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANN, a civil society coalition active in 100 countries, hailed the adoption of the resolution as a major step forward, marking a fundamental shift in the way that the world tackles this paramount threat. And now... Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. Japan is turning to a small German company to generate power from timber irradiated by the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear meltdowns. That's right, the lightly irradiated wood, just a mere sous-son for flavor of radiation, will be burned in Fukushima Prefecture to reduce the mass of the wood waste by 99.5%. It shrinks the volume but not the level of radioactive contamination. In fact, it concentrates that contamination. Company CEO Julian Uhlig admits, burning won't destroy radiation, but we can shrink detritus to ash and create a lot of clean power at the same time. Yeah, dude, along with soot, ash, smoke, all of which will carry that radiation out further into the environment. Uhlig also said, There's a lot of excitement about this project, but I also detect a high degree of reluctance in Fukushima to talk about radiation. That's because the government and the Secrecy Act has all but prevented anybody there from talking about it. And that's why Fukushima Prefecture and Trod Energy System AG and Julian Ulig, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. Here's this week's special extended interview. Robert Jacobs, who prefers to be called Bo, is a longtime listener to Nuclear Hot Seat. But I didn't know of the work that he did until he sent me a birthday message in September. Birthday greetings from Hiroshima. Hiroshima? Why did I not know he was there? And what was he doing there? And was there an interview in it? That led directly to this week's interview, and it's one of the best birthday presents I have ever received. Bo Jacobs is a professor at the Hiroshima Peace Institute of the Hiroshima City University, where he is an historian of nuclear technologies and radiation technopolitics. He's the author of The Dragon's Tale, 
Americans Face the Atomic Age, which is also available in a Japanese translation, and the editor of Filling the Hole in the Nuclear Future, Art and Popular Culture Respond to the Bomb, along with authoring numerous scientific papers. Since 2010, he has been a co-researcher for the Global Hibakusha Project. As you'll hear in the interview, I originally pronounced it Hibakusha until this interview taught me the proper pronunciation. Bo has been living in Hiroshima for over 11 years and joined us over Skype only two weeks after he returned from a trip inspecting long-term radioactive waste dumps being constructed in Scandinavia. Bo Jacobs, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here, Libby. Start out by telling us a little bit about your background and what prepared you to do the kind of work that you're doing now. Well, actually, I became really focused on nuclear things when I was a young boy growing up. We were given training similar to duck and cover training about how to prepare to survive nuclear attack. And what they told us was to be vigilant about the flash, the bright white flash. And so I went home and sat on the steps of my house and waited for the flash and waited for the flash like they had trained us. And suddenly I had this feeling of the house behind me dissolving and the school across the street dissolving, and I became terrified. Perhaps it was the first time I was aware of my own mortality, but it really made me afraid of nuclear weapons. So I began reading everything I could find about nuclear weapons, and I really haven't stopped since then. How old were you at the time? This was when I was eight years old in Skokie, Illinois. And so I began reading about nuclear weapons, and a lot of the stuff in those days was how to survive, and also stories about the Manhattan Project. And I've really never stopped. I'm still reading about it. And in university, I studied the history of science and technology. I knew I wanted to study nuclear history, but I wanted to come at it from a science and technology perspective and a historical perspective. I did my graduate work at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and had the good fortune to work with people who were very familiar with the Manhattan Project, very familiar with nuclear weapons development. So I ended up getting a PhD in history of science and technology, focusing on nuclear technology. And from there, ended up here at the Hiroshima Peace Institute, which is part of Hiroshima City University, where I'm a historian studying uh, nuclear history and the effects of radiation on communities. Tell us a little bit about the work that you have been doing. Well, my early work was about a nuclear representation and nuclear narratives in American culture. This is what I started out doing in, in graduate school, and the first book that I published was based on that. The way that people in the United States learned to think about nuclear weapons, the way they learned to think about what nuclear war would be like, the way they learned to think about what radiation was. But especially after I arrived here in Hiroshima, I began to really focus on how nuclear weapons have affected people. And there's been quite a lot of study done here in Hiroshima and in Nagasaki. And there's quite a lot of memory culture built up in these towns about the nuclear attacks here. And I began to focus on people who had not really been considered yet in most of our historical inquiry. And this started with people living near nuclear test sites. So for the last six or seven years, I've been working with uh, my research collaborator, who's Dr. Mick Broderick from Australia, and we've been collecting oral history interviews among radiation-affected communities. So this is primarily nuclear test site communities, but it also includes nuclear accident sites, nuclear production sites like Hanford, Washington, and in addition to that, with various cohorts of people who had been exposed to radiation from nuclear weapons, such as so-called atomic soldiers and various other people. The term hibakusha is the Japanese word for the surviving victims of the 1945 atomic bombings at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the word literally translates as explosion-affected people. You are working now on something called the Global Hibakusha Project. How is the term factored into the work that you are doing, and how did this project come about? That's a great question, because it's actually a somewhat controversial use of the term. I was going to ask that one as well, as to how the use of the word is being received by those people who identify as Hibakusha in that first generation. There's a lot of different issues to unpack around that. Myself and my research collaborator, we're not the first people to use it in this way. In some ways, I believe it might have even been Robert Lifton, 
in the 60s who talked about because of nuclear testing and the spread of radiation around the atmosphere and the ecosystem that all of us were in a sense hibakusha because we were all being exposed to radiation from nuclear weapons because of nuclear testing. So there's been some use of the term in a more broader way over time. One of the things for us in the research we did in founding the Global Hibakusha Project is that we realized that there's this sense that nuclear weapons should never be used again against people after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But of course, knowing that there was over 2,000 nuclear weapon tests during the course of the Cold War, we began to think it was very naive to believe that people were unaffected by nuclear weapons after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so we began to think about the immense community of people, which is millions of people really around the world, who have been affected by nuclear weapon detonations, whose health has been affected by it, whose communities have been affected by it. And so we decided to begin a project called the Global Hibakusha Project and begin to look at those affected by nuclear weapons as a global community rather than as just people here in Hiroshima. And at the time, the inquiry that had been done in test site communities had been very much focused on the offending country. There were studies of victims of U.S. nuclear testing in Nevada, in the Marshall Islands. There were studies of victims of French nuclear testing in French Polynesia or in Algeria, studies of British victims of nuclear testing. And what we were interested in doing was looking at those previous studies, but also trying to look globally at these communities. Because what we found when we began to visit and do site visits to many of these communities was that they remained isolated. They interpreted their history in relationship to the power that had irradiated them, which in many cases was a colonial power. And so as a result, we were interested in two things. One, in understanding the impacts of radiation on people at nuclear test sites beyond the borders of which countries were doing what where. And looking at this as a large global community who had suffered similar problems, similar experiences because of the irradiation of their communities and their bodies. And also part of what we sought to do was to try to find ways to begin to link these communities together because they tend to be very, very remotely located. They tend to be under-resourced. They tend to be without access to a tremendous amount of information, which is usually controlled in the Marshall Islands. Information is somewhat tightly controlled by the United States, in Australia, by the British government in terms of what weapons were used, what the extent of the radioactive fallout was. And so there was different amounts of information in different communities. And we felt that if these communities could politically reconstitute themselves as a global community, there would be much more political power in their ability to seek redress and also bear witness to the history of their communities in relation to nuclear weapons. What work have you done and what have you discovered about how these people standing in their countries with their neighbors, with their children, trying to find mates and get married and have children of their own. How has the exposure to nuclear radiation impacted the possibility for them building the kind of future that they want for their families? It's, it's been, been devastating. devastating. It's, it's been, been devastating, devastating for a number of reasons. reasons. First of all, you have, you have very, very severe health impacts. impacts. You have quite a lot of cancers, immune disorders, other health impacts from radiation. So you have people who are enduring sickness and illness, which of course impedes their full lives, impedes their ability to provide for themselves, their ability to take care of their families, their ability to marry, all kinds of things. Then there's also prejudices. A lot of communities that are exposed to radiation are removed from their communities, sometimes forcibly. And then they become refugee populations who are living with other non-irradiated people. And in these cases, they tend to be specifically identified as a wounded or a contaminated population. And so they're less likely to be married. They're less likely to be employed. They're less likely to be in the position of owning property when, they're, when they come into communities as outsiders and refugees. So depending on exactly what happened in specific communities, whether people were removed, whether people were left to live in irradiated places, there's some variance to how the radiation has impacted their lives. But for all of them, there's been devastating impacts. And these impacts, we track them along a couple of different pathways. One, we look at the breakdown in community structure, 
You see this very, very immediately in a place like Fukushima right now, where you have families that had been living in multi-generational homes in which you have elderly parents being cared for by their children. You have grandparents providing daycare for the grandchildren so the parents can work. So you have this very traditional interdependence of generations in communities. Well, when people are evacuated from these communities, they're frequently evacuated not as intergenerational families, but the elderly parents are sometimes put into nursing homes, the nuclear family is isolated. So you have some breakdowns in the family's ability to function and have support in a broad, wider family. You have breakdowns in social networks, communities where teachers and shop owners know the children, know the families, and there's cohesion, there's safety that comes from everybody knowing who's who. Suddenly you have all of these people living in quote unquote temporary housing, which almost always has become permanent housing in the past. So on the level of community, there's breakdowns. On the level of family structure, there's breakdowns. And also on the level of individual wellness, there's breakdowns in terms of people's sense of the integrity of their own health, their uh, ability to have agency and access to data about their own health conditions. In some cases, you have people who become medical subjects like the Hibakusha here in Hiroshima and Nagasaki did with the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission, where since they were exposed to radiation, data is gathered about their health progress, but they're frequently not given the details of this tracking, which has a way of creating a power imbalance that makes people feel subjective and without agency or power over their own health care. Uh, so there's a wide variety of ways in which Different communities have experienced breakdowns as a result of radiological exposure. Talk about what the process is when you choose to go into a community and do these interviews and gather this information. Are you in touch with groups beforehand? Do you do outreach? Do you set this up? How does it proceed? That's actually a critical question. We were very, very well aware from the start of our study that people like ourselves, academics, we understand ourselves as kind of a last wave of colonialism. One of the ways we understand most nuclear test site selection is that it's essentially a colonial process. England has never tested nuclear weapons inside the UK. France has never tested weapons inside France. The United States has never tested thermonuclear weapons inside the United States. It's usually the case for many countries that they test nuclear weapons in far reaches of what is either an actual existing colonial relationship or a softer colonial relationship. So many of the people in these communities, they've been selected because they're politically marginalized people to begin with. So there's a power imbalance to the selection of the community. Now, most of this testing, especially the atmospheric testing, is in the past, you know, 40, 50 years, 60 years. And we understood that we are very much kind of a last wave of colonialism. Academics and journalists that show up to these communities, we extract stories. That's the resource we extract. We extract stories and oral histories. We go back to the developed world where we establish our careers or further our careers with this resource that we've gathered in these far colonial reaches. This was something we wanted to be conscious of and that we wanted to avoid participating in. So part of our design from the beginning was that the intellectual property rights over every interview belongs to the interviewee. So if we want to use any interview that we conduct, we need to get the explicit permission of the people we interviewed for each usage of it. And we need to provide them with a copy of its usage so they can see how they are represented and how their stories are represented. But beyond that, the way we approach community, which is the core of your question, for example, if you go to the Marshall Islands, if you go to the Aboriginal communities in Australia where nuclear testing was done, there's kind of an established social mechanism for people like ourselves that arrive seeking to interview local people about their experiences. Typically, there's four or five or six people who are fairly experienced at speaking in English to outsiders and telling the story of what happened to them. And these people become representative of the community. And so what happens typically is somebody like ourselves, academics, would show up and this mechanism for producing, in a sense, cultural consumption for outsiders sort of kicks in. And so we understood this very well and we wanted to sidestep this. We know that, in a sense, white guys with microphones are something that they're used to processing socially. 
So typically, before we travel to any community, we make as extensive contacts as we can with existing groups to support Hibakusha within the communities, uh, within the countries. Frequently, the activists are people who are not themselves exposed to radiation. So we try to make as many contacts as we can with the NGOs there. We try to make as many contacts as we can with social structures of authority in the communities. In many communities, this means elders speaking to elders, mayors, or various leaders of the communities. And in our first visit to communities, we do not gather any oral history testimony. So when we show up and we're people saying, no, please, we don't want to interview anybody during this visit. We want to meet people during this visit. Then suddenly we find ourselves on a slightly different footing with the people we encounter because we're not there as culture consumers. We're there as collaborators. And so we want to meet them. We want to have them tell us about their community. We want to have them to tell us a little bit about their history. We tell them about the work we're doing, about the work we've done in other communities. So we go there and relationship build before we try to do conduct any interviews. And this is partly our way of stepping outside of the existing tracks that are prepared to process people like ourselves. And these are done for very, very good reasons, because there's all kinds of stories we've heard in various communities of people like ourselves, journalists or academics that come in, can frequently exercise tremendous insensitivity in their goal of gathering what it is they seek to gather before they leave. So they, to have certain people come forward, tell their story in a way that's sort of sanctioned or predictable is a protective measure for the community. Lots of people who do work in communities do fantastic work, but these communities are frequently, they want to get their message out. They have an agenda to get their message out. And they, and so we just try to step outside of all of this as much as possible and establish more long-term relationships and have people understand that we're not just there to gather a story and go back and print an article. We're also interested to link them in ways with other communities. We're also interested to share with them information we've gathered in other communities. So these are some of the strategies we had to try to be as respectful guests as we could be in these communities that received us. Once you have this first visit under your belt, how is it set up for you to return? Do you plan on a second trip where you do gather oral histories or is there an interim step? How does this play out? We usually plan on a second trip in which we intend to come back and we frequently do come back to communities to gather oral histories. At this point, we frequently have enough relationship with people in the community, with elders in the community or activists in the community that they understand who we are and they understand in a sense that we would like to go a little bit deeper in the things that we gather. And so on those return visits, we're then received more as friends rather than as strangers with microphones, which is partly what we want to do. And additionally, another thing that I'll mention is that we were always cognizant from the start that we were removing resources from a community and that we would like to, in any way we could, return resources to communities. We had a very small grant that we were operating on, so that wouldn't really matter. Frequently, we would ask, in what way might we be able to bring some kind of assistance to your community? And we found that one of the things we heard more often than not was there's trouble in this community in getting younger people to engage with this history. They look at this history as their grandparents' history. They themselves were not exposed to radiation. They themselves didn't experience nuclear testing. And they're interested in their lives in the modern world, which is very natural. But people in the communities are frequently worried that this history will get lost. We heard this in many places. And then we had this sort of really critical experience in the Marshall Islands. We were giving a presentation in a college class in the College of the Marshall Islands in Majuro, which is the capital atoll, and which is where most of the people from Bikini were moved to. A lot of the people from Rongelap were moved there. And we were giving a talk to about 30 college students in a class on nuclear studies. The teacher said that the students needed to write a two-page response paper to our lecture presentation. And so all 30 students reached in their pockets, pulled out smartphones, and started filming us so that they would have a copy of our talk so they could write their papers. So we're looking out at a room of 30 people, 30 students holding up phones, 
And it just looked to us like a resource. It looked to us like we were looking into this new world that had new possibilities. Now, I'll add to this that my collaborator, Mick Broderick from Australia, had already been doing work in Rwanda for several years, training young filmmakers on how to make films using low budget cameras, using the video function of cheap cameras or using the video function of phones. Since many of the budding filmmakers in Rwanda didn't have access to high priced equipment. So given his experience in Rwanda, given what we were looking at, we began to think that there was this possibility to begin to try to link up young people between these nuclear test site communities, given Web 2.0 kind of technology. Whereas previously, the linkages between test site communities was, was frequently through one or two fairly elite community members who could speak English and who could travel to speak at the United Nations or travel to speak on behalf of the community. But there was this capacity that existed now because of technology for linkages between these communities to happen from the bottom up rather than from the top down. And so we began to think about how we might use this as a means of linking these communities together through youth. So the first thing we did was set up a few Skype conversations between young people. The first one, we had 10 young people in the Marshall Islands and 10 young people in Hiroshima. We opened up Skype for an hour and we introduced them and we just let them talk. We didn't guide it at all. Probably the first 20, 25 minutes was the students in the Marshall Islands asking the students in Japan, what is cool new manga? Because they were, of course, into Japanese youth culture like youth are all around the world. And they figured these Japanese students in Hiroshima could tell us instead of us waiting to find what manga comes to us. So they had this long talk about manga and anime long before they got to anything else. And eventually they did talk about how their communities were affected by nuclear weapons, how their families were affected by nuclear weapons. And so we used this as a model and eventually began a couple of workshops the idea of the workshops was to have third generation hibaksha. So this would be people whose grandparents either experienced nuclear attack or nuclear testing and bring together third generation hibaksha from several locations and take three days and train them all on how to gather oral history testimony. So we had our first workshop in the Marshall Islands. This was in 2014. It was on the 60th anniversary of the Bravo nuclear test, which is the nuclear test that devastated the Marshall Islands. March 1st, the anniversary of the Bravo test is a national holiday in the Marshall Islands. It's Nuclear Victims and Survivors Remembrance Day. So it was in the end of February, beginning of March uh, 2014. We had four Marshallese students. We had two students from Hiroshima and two students from Kazakhstan, from Semipolitan in Kazakhstan. So we gathered all of these students together. They were all college students, all roughly around 20, 21, 22. We gathered them in Majuro, the capital of the Marshall Islands. We held the workshop for three days. And in those three days, we didn't teach them anything about nuclear history. We didn't have people give long testimonies about their communities. We had each person talk just briefly about their community and their family. But essentially for three days, what we did was train them how to gather oral history testimony. We taught them how to prepare for oral history interviews, how to prepare questions, how to research for it, how to conduct oral history interviews, some of the dynamics of oral history, for example, frequently in an oral history interview, the person being interviewed has, in a sense, a package they want to deliver to you, This is the story that they want you to get, that they're invested in you getting, and regardless of what your questions are, one of the techniques, regardless of what your questions are, you need to graciously receive this from them, have them tell you just what it is that they want you to know and what's important to them. And then from there, you can proceed into the lines of inquiry you're interested in, which may feed off what their stories were. It may be separate from that, but that part of the dynamic was to be a gracious recipient before you begin asking for things. So some of these sorts of techniques, and then in addition to this, how to record and film the interviews, how microphones work. Each of them was given an iPad mini, how to use the iPad mini to record the interview, 
how to photograph, how to understand backlighting, how to understand framing, and then also how to edit the video and how to digitally deposit the video in several places so that there's copies kept of it. There were two real goals in the design of these workshops. The first goal was that oral histories begin to be gathered through networks inside the communities rather than by outsiders like ourselves. All of these young people had the capacity to begin to gather interviews through networks of family and neighbors and community, places that people like ourselves would rarely get access. We'll get access to the people that speak to foreign outsiders. It's hard for us to penetrate very much past that unless we spend a lot of time in community, like some anthropologists who've worked in some communities have done this, you know, spent months there and gotten much deeper interviews. But This way, there would be community history being gathered by young people in the community. So it would help to maintain the history in the community. It would have the interviews be conducted in indigenous languages. And the other thing that we were interested in doing was having these young people have an amazing experience where they come together and meet people from other radiation affected communities and have a three day kind of, you know, The students from the Marshall Islands took all the other students out and showed them how to go have fun in the Marshall Islands. They then have this capacity to stay in touch via Facebook, via email, via social media of all sorts. So part of what we wanted was to do some networking and community building across these communities, as well as resourcing young people inside the communities. In theory, what our hopes are is that many of these students are identified and become the participants because they are sort of budding community leaders in their youth communities. So 10 years from now, 20 years from now, they may be more in a position of power and influence in their communities. And they'll have met people from the Marshall Islands or Kazakhstan or Hiroshima. And so they'll have these networks with which they can pursue things that are a benefit to their own communities. We've been talking just generically about communities, about countries. How many countries and how many communities have you and your partner gone into in order to gain the friendships, gain the trust, and then gather the information? How many places are we talking about here? Well, it depends in a sense on how you define community. Because, for example, we have done quite a lot of interviewing of soldiers that took part in nuclear tests. Soldiers from the UK, from France, from the United States, from Australia, even from New Zealand, and a few from Russia. And so those are not radiation-affected communities, but those are communities of people. Some of our research has not been on site at radiation locations. For example, in the Marshall Islands, when we've gone there, we have not gone to Bikini or Rongelap because there's not really that many people living in those places. Those communities have been evacuated, and they're living primarily in Majuro. So a lot of the visits that we do aren't specifically to the test site, but to where the communities of people who were affected by the radiation are living. I think that we've been on site at over a dozen test sites, and probably if you add in production sites, maybe close to 20 sites. And then additionally, in the home countries of the nuclear weapon states where the soldier population, some of the laborers and some of the scientists and various other cohorts of people who in the course of nuclear testing were exposed to radiation or uh, additionally nuclear production. Is there any difference that you find in the way people respond to or carry this nuclear burden forward between the people who were near test sites versus those who were near production facilities or nuclear storage facilities? Is there a difference in the way this has impacted them? The differences in the ways that it's impacted them is largely cultural. Some of the exposures are very similar in terms of the radiological exposures. And and I should add, uh, which I don't think I've mentioned, that we don't study in any way epidemiology. We study non-epidemiological impacts because most of the studies of these communities are focused on epidemiological disease presentation. Explain a little bit more about what you mean about the epidemiological versus the non-epidemiological studies. The most important effect of radiological exposure, and of course, rightfully so, is disease and death. People can suffer cancers, other diseases as a result of either external or internal exposure to radiation, and this is critically important. 
most of the studies of these populations are epidemiological studies. They're studies of how the radiation exposures in the community have resulted in disease in that population from that community. We are not trying to look at how radiation has created illness in these communities. We're looking at how the communities have been changed, the social structures have been changed, what the impacts of radiological exposure are besides disease. And one of the easy ways to illustrate how that's important is when we look at, for example, the population that was affected by Chernobyl, or when we look more readily at hand for most of your listeners, I'm sure, is Fukushima. When we will look back on Fukushima in 20 years, the main way we'll look back on it is that we will count cancers. This is partly what we're doing now. We're saying how many thyroid cancers in children have been detected since Fukushima? Thyroid cancer is the first cancer that presents from internalized radiation, but over time, other cancers will present and we'll begin to look at this disease presentation as the impact of Fukushima. There were this many thyroid cancers, there were this many leukemias, and we'll talk about that as the impact. But as we all know, hundreds of thousands of people have been impacted by Fukushima. Hundreds of thousands of people's lives have been radically altered because of Fukushima, whether it's because their communities were forcibly evacuated, whether it's because they themselves self-evacuated if they were in areas where the plumes came down from the explosions, or whether it's because they stayed living where they were living, but had to take all kinds of steps to make sure that they were safe and their children were safe from radiation. There's all kinds of ways that people's businesses, their home values, are deteriorated, community infrastructure is deteriorated, schools and other support networks are deteriorated in communities. So all kinds of people will be affected by the Fukushima disaster, but most of them will remain invisible over time and through history because our focus will be on the people who got sick. And that's natural because that's a life and death thing. So of course we're looking at that. But what our work was trying to do was to look at all of those other impacts, all of those ways that people's lives are altered and changed besides getting sick. And so those are the non-epidemiological impacts that, that we focused on. What is your goal in terms of making this information available? Have you been publishing papers all along? Are there books that have resulted? We've been publishing papers, and currently I'm in the middle of work on a manuscript that has emerged out of all of this work. It should be, in the next few years, published in book form. But meanwhile, there have been some journal articles, but also I've written some for general readership, too. Well, of course, you're going to be giving us some links for the website. Certainly, you bet. Bo Jacobs has much more to say, including his insights following a tour inside long-term radioactive waste storage sites currently being built in Sweden and Finland, along with his philosophy on how to survive the work that we do. But first, as you can tell from today's interview, Nuclear Hot Seat is always looking for different ways to consider and share information on the many aspects of the nuclear issue. Over five and a half years, we've become an information resource on a wide, wild range of nuclear topics. Just check the archive on our website to see what we've covered. And we're always looking for the stories that make sense from a human, yet journalistically verifiable perspective. In order to do so, guess what? We incur expenses. So won't you help us cover them? We make it easy for you to donate. Just go to the website, nuclearhotseat.com, and click on the big red Donate button. You can use your PayPal account, debit card, or credit card. Or if you prefer to donate by check, we can make arrangements for that, too. Be this a one-time boost or the start of a monthly Starbucks donation, the same as a cup of coffee plus tip, Whatever you can do to help support the work of Nuclear Hot Seat, we appreciate it, and we thank you. Now back to part two of our interview with Bo Jacobs of the Hiroshima Peace Foundation and the Global Hibakusha Project. Just two weeks ago, you came back from your most recent field work. Tell us where you went and what that trip was about. As you said, I just returned to Hiroshima two weeks ago. Before that, I had spent two weeks in Sweden and Finland. And what I was doing in Sweden and Finland was going to tour the deep underground spent nuclear fuel storage sites in both countries. 
Sweden has dug a test site to sort of explore the concept of storing spent nuclear fuel from commercial nuclear power plants half a kilometer underground. So this test site is sort of a proof of concept, and they are now building the actual storage site for the spent nuclear fuel of the Swedish nuclear industry at a separate location. In Sweden, I was able to go down into this test site half a kilometer underground and essentially take a tour and encounter what this planning is, what the strategy is, what the technology is, how the canisters are constructed, how the waste will be set there, and the preparations for this. Finland is actually building their deep underground spent nuclear fuel storage site. So it's based on that Swedish model. It's developed from that Swedish model, but it is the actual site that will begin receiving spent nuclear fuel rods about 10 years from now. And it will be the ultimate repository for all of the spent nuclear fuel from the Finnish commercial nuclear power industry. And there I was able to uh, receive a full tour and go down and do a tour of the existing deep underground storage site. Once it begins to accept fuel in 10 years, the public will not be allowed in again. Right now, there are three days a year where journalists or scholars can participate in tours and be brought down in the site to observe it. So I went there now in part because there's a short window in which it'll be possible to visit this site and actually see it. What has been or what do you project will be the impact of these storage sites on the communities around them? When you're talking about storing spent nuclear fuel, you begin to get involved in talking about a very, very abstract timeline. So there's the impact on the communities currently. Both of these sites are sites of existing nuclear power plants. So these are communities that have had nuclear power plants operating in them for 30 to 40 years. They're fairly rural communities. So for the most part, these communities have been very welcoming of the nuclear power plants in the industry. It's been a job provider. It's been a wealth producer in these communities. And because of the construction of these deep underground storage sites, they promise to remain job providers and wealth providers for 50 to 100 years during the period of time that these are being constructed and filled and until that's finished. So the current relationship with the communities is fairly good. However, because we're talking about spent nuclear fuel rods, we are talking about waste that will remain dangerous for up to a million years or beyond. And so the relationship of the community to these sites will be one that evolves and changes over time. And so as I've been doing this work, my own understanding and my own grappling with the presence and legacy of nuclear technologies has really changed and evolved. And I've become much more interested in sort of the long, slow violence of nuclear technologies. One of the ways that I look at it is that we in our world today, we tend to be obsessed with this discourse of catastrophe when it comes to nuclear technologies. In other words, if nuclear weapons are not used in anger and war against civilian populations, then we have successfully managed nuclear weapons. We did right by them. If nuclear power plants don't experience meltdowns, then we've operated those nuclear power plants correctly. So our sense of success and failure in relationship to this technology is essentially about the existence of this technology in a 50 to 100 year time frame in our own lives, essentially, in our own lifespan. But we're talking about things whose impact will unfold over hundreds of thousands of years. And so what I came to understand in my own mind was that this is a very limited way to understand our actions and this technology. If we don't have a disaster in our lifetimes, we were successful. However, we have manufactured hundreds of thousands of tons of highly radioactive transuranic toxic chemicals like plutonium, which did not exist in nature, but all of this was created by human beings that thousands of generations will have to grapple with in some form or other. So by manufacturing these materials, we have entered into a relationship that spans hundreds of thousands of years. 
We don't look at that as successful or not successful. We just look at, did the plant melt down? Did the weapon explode? But in order to get that plant to operate and not melt down, in order to have that weapon exist, we had to manufacture these unbelievably dangerous toxins that will long outlive our civilization. And so in my mind, for people, let's just say a thousand years from now or 2000 years from now, whether or not we had the nuclear war in the Cold War may seem immaterial to them. It may be that their legacy from our behavior is the same as if we had the nuclear war. And it's really just our business. Did we have the nuclear war? Did we have the nuclear meltdown? How much did we damage our own society during our own lifespans? But because of the production of these materials, we are putting thousands of generations both at risk and in relationship with the waste that we've created. And so I'm beginning to try to understand nuclear technology from a deeper time perspective. They're in Sweden, they're in Finland. You can begin to see some of how we are understanding our relationship with time and our understanding of our relationship with future generations and the ecosystem. And so it's fascinating for me to go and to look at this and to see how this is constructed, how we're constructing both the technology and how we're constructing our understanding of our own behavior and our understanding of our relationship with future generations. And it is deeply concerning. I certainly do believe that probably these are good ideas to put this waste in these deep underground sites because the waste exists. Right now in the United States, this waste is sitting in parking lots, essentially, at the nuclear power plants all around the country decaying. To say nothing of the waste that has already been illegally or improperly, quote unquote, disposed of, that is leaching into the water and blowing in the wind and continuing to contaminate and recontaminate ever greater areas, as certainly the people of North St. Louis can attest to with the waste buried at the Westlake landfill, as certainly the people who are downwinders from all those over 900 tests that took place above ground in Nevada. I mean, it is everywhere. And so we are all in relationship to this waste, whether we know it or not. Absolutely. We are all in relationship with nuclear technology, nuclear waste. It's unavoidable. The distribution of radionuclides around the world from atmospheric nuclear testing is something that all living creatures have to grapple with. These long-lived radionuclides, once they enter the ecosystem, Gordon Edwards, the, the wonderful scientist up in Canada, one of the things that he said that I always try to use as a means of explaining, especially here in Japan where people talk about Fukushima, is that every time you hear the word decontaminate, you should think of the word distribute. Because you cannot make a radioactive element not radioactive. You can just move it. So you cannot decontaminate. You can simply move the contamination from one place to another. But these really long-lived radionuclides they will stay in their chemical state for these long periods of time, for thousands and thousands of years. During that period of time, they will simply move through the ecosystem. They may be deposited deep underground where they sit for some long period of time, but for the most part, they will move with wind and water. This is why when you quote unquote decontaminate a schoolyard in a contaminated part of Fukushima, you wait a season or two and it's recontaminated because there's so much contamination on the hillsides and in the forests that as the rain comes and the wind blows and trees fall down, this contamination simply begins to move through the ecosystem. So we are all in somewhat permanent relationship with a lot of these radionuclides. And especially in Japan, where so much of the quote unquote decontamination, I like the word substitution there of distribution, is put into the large green they look like lawn bags, lawn debris bags, and then they're stacked up and then they just sit there and then the rain and the wind comes and the bags split open and it gets redistributed all over again. It's a form of theater. It's a form of theater. It creates the illusion of cleanliness. It creates the illusion of response. It creates the illusion that something has been done and that things have been changed and now it's safe and now it's okay. But as we know, those radionuclides will long outlive those plastic bags. 
So what we have where all of those bags are stacked is eventually just a giant pile of radioactive soil. That soil is not going to sit there for 100,000 years. It's going to be spread by wind and water, and it will be redistributed throughout that area. Putting it in the bags and moving it to the edge of town is this theatrical production of technologically capable response. But it's really theater. It's for social consumption. It's not really a physical or technological fix for what happened there. So from your perspective, having dealt with so many people and spoken with so many people who were directly affected by nuclear radiation from the bomb blasts, from the bomb tests and the like, and now looking into the future and seeing how long we're going to have this relationship, which is forever, let's face it, in terms of mm-hmm. human lifespan, this is forever. How do you cope with this information And what do we do when we learn about it to keep from going mad? Well, you know, this is, of course, at the core. You and I are people who've been doing this for a long time. And we've seen a lot of people become involved in this kind of work. And one of the things that I'm a very, very big believer in is you have to work very hard to make sure that you have some joy in your life every day. So you have to sustain yourself in order to continue to do good work on deeply troubling and tragic issues. Or as my friend Mick says, put the oxygen mask on yourself before you put the oxygen mask on others. I met a lot of people who became involved in nuclear issues for the first time after Fukushima, of course, because it was so distressing and so large. And I've told all of those young activists and I tell all of those young activists that are listening to this show now every day take a walk, enjoy a glass of wine with friends, have dinner with people you love, have a nice talk with people that you care about. Make sure that you don't spend your entire day thinking about how terrible nuclear issues are or for people who work on any dark topic, whatever the topic is. My wife is a psychotherapist. We look at it that we do similar work. I do it in a more abstract, global way. She does it really directly one-on-one with people. But essentially, one of the things is at the end of the day, you've spent a lot of time during that day coming in touch with how much people's lives are harmed and how much people have to deal with hardship. You know, whether it's the toxic effects of childhood that last throughout people's lifetimes or whether it's the toxic effects of this technology, which will go on into millennia for us as a species and for other living creatures on Earth. And so the only way that anybody it's like a doctor in an emergency room. The only way you can continue to do this kind of work effectively is to take care of yourself, is to make sure that you have sources of happiness and sources of joy in your life to nurture them and don't neglect yourself. Believing that constant vigilance and constant work on these problems is your only option. You really need to stop and take a breath, stop and dance a little bit. It's essential to your ability to continue to work for 30 or 40 or 50 years on these issues. There is no escaping the things that happened. The things that happened are a part of what we go forward in our lives and as a species with. So we can't escape We've created this radiological waste. It's not a matter of, you know, how do we stop meltdowns? That is important to stop meltdowns. They're devastating to people's lives. But even if we don't have another meltdown or use another weapon in war, we have to face the fact that we have created this waste. We can't go back and unmake it. Even though it's not a good idea to store it deep underground, it's a worse idea to store it above ground. So we have to do the best we can to grapple with the situation that does actually exist. And in order to do that, we need to take care of ourselves because it's very easy. I'm sure you, just like me, I've seen a lot of people who get very, very focused on these kinds of issues and burn out after five or six years because all of this work and all of this effort of theirs hasn't changed the world yet. One of the other things I would add is, to me, a guiding belief is something that I heard from the novelist Doris Lessing. This is the British novelist, tremendous novelist, who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago and passed away just, I think, two years ago. She said that when she was young, in the teens and in the 20s, that the things that to her seemed so big and so evil that there was nothing she, as a young woman living in Africa at the time, that she could do to change. And what she meant by that in her life was the horrors of the British Empire and colonialism and also then Stalin's Russia. 
she had been a young communist. She had been a very idealistic communist. And for many people of her generation, wrapping their heads around what the Soviet Union had become under Stalin was, was a difficult process. But she felt like here she grew up in the British Empire. She grew up out in the colonies. And she understood the brutality of empire and the brutality of colonialism. She saw what was going on in the Soviet Union. And she felt utterly powerless to do anything. These things were so big and she was just one woman. And now at the time she was telling this story, she was, I think in her eighties or nineties, she said, now those things that I thought were so big and evil, I could never change them are gone. So what people should understand is that over the course of history, all things will change. And so all of the little things you do to fight against the injustices of the world and all of the little things you do to fight against these monstrous evils that don't seem altered by all of your work, all of those little things you do is part of how this will happen. So have faith in all of the small things that you do and understand that they are part of a continuum that changes history. So this to me guides my work all the time. I've been working on this stuff for a long, long time. It's very hard to see the direct fruits of my own labor but I feel as though I'm a part of a community. I feel that I am a part of a movement. And I feel that it's inexorable in the course of history. Even now in Sweden and Finland, where I was seeing these sites, they're planning that they're going to be done producing nuclear fuel rods at some set point in the future. So they're thinking of how to deal with this waste, but they're not planning to continue producing this waste for 500 more years. They get that this is not a good idea. So the nuclear power industry will stop. It's simply not economically viable and it's a catastrophic industry. It will have done tremendous amount of damage. There will be tremendous amount of damage to the ecosystem and to living creatures in the future because of the legacy of this industry. And this industry, of course, was born out of nuclear weapon production. Nuclear power plants were invented to produce nuclear weapons. The damage that's been done by this is done. It's ongoing. We have to do the best we can to grapple with it. But it's already dying. It's already a dying industry. Part of the reason it's a dying industry is all of the people who have worked to raise awareness around the safety issues, to demand on safety protocols. All of the people who have worked to fight nuclear power during the course of, of its existence, all of them should take some pride in the fact that this industry is really coming close to the end of its run. Bo, well, this has been an extraordinary interview. For now, I'm going to let you go with my gratitude and deepest thanks for having been my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Oh, it's been my pleasure, Libby. And uh, take care and keep up the great work and the great shows. I look forward to them every week. That was Bo Jacobs of the Hiroshima Peace Foundation and the Global Hibakusha Project. We'll have links up to Bo and his work on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode number 280. Here's today's final thought. Follow the philosophy Bo Jacobs just shared. Make certain you have some joy in your life today and every day, because ultimately it's the only thing that will get us through and keep us going. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, November 1st, 2016. Material from this week's program has been researched and compiled from Bloomberg.com, ICANW.org, Plowshares.org, KyotoNews.jp, CommonDreams.org, BBC.com, Reuters.com, ExchangeMonitor.com, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the caring, gentle, yet fierce warriors of the anti-nuclear movement who gather at Nuclear Hot Seat on Facebook, where you are all invited to join us, like us, and share your posts with your friends and family. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. If you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed, as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that nuclear waste is forever. And that's a pretty big nuclear wake-up call all by itself. So don't go back to sleep, because we are all 
in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.